if I show up to a new planet, we'll go to Mars or some other planet from a different solar system. And how do we use assembly index there to discover alien life? Um, in very simply, actually, if we let's say we'll go to Mars with a mass spectrometer with a sufficiently high resolution. So what you have to be able to do. So a good thing about mass spec um, is that you can um, select the molecule from the mass. And then if it's high enough resolution, you can be more and more sure that you're just seeing um, identical copies. You can count them. And then you fragment them and you count the number of fragments and look at the molecular weight. And the higher the molecular weight and the higher the number of the fragments, the higher the assembly index. So if you go to Mars and you take a mass spec or a high enough resolution and you can find molecules, and I'll give a guide on Earth, if you could find molecules, say, greater than 350 molecular weight with more than 15 fragments. You have found artifacts that can only be produced, at least on Earth, by life. Now, you would say, oh, well, maybe the geological process. I would argue very vehemently that that is not the case. But we can say, look, if you don't like the cutoff on Earth, go up higher, 30, 100, <laughs> right? Because there's going to be a point where you can find a molecule with so many different parts, the chances of you getting a molecule that has a hundred different parts um, and finding a million identical copies, you know, that's, that's just impossible. That could never happen in an infinite set of universes. Can you just linger on this copy number thing? Uh, a million different copies. What do you mean by copies and why is the number of copies important? Yeah, that, that was so interesting. And in um, I... Always understood the copy number was really important, but I never explained it properly <laughs> for ages. Um, and it, I kept having this, it goes back to this, if I give you a, um, a, a, I don't know, a really complicated molecule, and I say it's complicated, you could say, hey, that's really complicated, but is it just really random? Mm -hmm. And so, so I realized that ultimate randomness and ultimate complexity are indistinguishable until you can um you can see a structure in the randomness so you can see copies so copies implies structure yeah the fact i mean there's a deep profound thing in there because like if you just have a random random process you're going to get a lot of complex beautiful sophisticated things mm -hmm. what makes them complex in the way we think life is complex or uh, yeah something like a, a factory that's operating under a selection process is there should be copies is there like some looseness about copies like what does it mean for two objects to be equal it, it's it's all to do with the the telescope or the microscope you're using and so at the, the maximum resolution so in the nice thing about the nice thing about chemists is they have this concept of the molecule and they're all familiar with the molecule and molecules you can hold, uh, you know, in your hand, um, lots of them, mm -hmm. identical copies. Uh, a molecule is actually a super important thing in chemistry to say, look, you can have a mole of a molecule, so an Avogadro's number of molecules, and they're identical. What does that mean? That means that the molecular composition, the bonding and so on, the configuration is all is, is indistinguishable. You can hold them together. You can overlay them. So the way I do it is if I say... Here's a bag um, of ten identical molecules. Let's prove they're identical. You pick one out of the, the out of the bag and you basically observe it using some technique, and then you put it, you take it away, and then you put, take another one out. If you observe it using technique, you can see no differences. They're identical. It's really interesting to get right because if you take, say, two molecules, molecules can be in different vibrational and rotational states. They're moving all the time. So for this respect, identical molecules have identical bonding. Mm -hmm. In this case, we don't even uh, um, talk about chirality because we don't have a chirality detector. So two identical molecules in one conception assembly theory basically um, considers both hands as being the same. Um, but, of, but of course, they're not. They're different. As soon as you have a chiral to distinguisher detect, to detect the left and the right hand, they become different. And so it's to do with the detection system that you have and the resolution. So I wonder if there's an art and science to the which detection system is used when you show up to a new planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you're talking about chemistry a lot today. We have kind of standardized detection systems, right? 
of how to compare molecules. So, you know, when you start to talk about emojis and language and uh, mathematical theorems and, uh, I don't know, more sophisticated things at a different scale, at a smaller scale than molecules, at a larger scale than molecules, like what detection, like if, if we look at the difference between you and me, Lex and Lee, are we the same? Are we different? Sure. I mean, of course we're different close up, but if you zoom out a little bit, yeah. we'll morphologically look the same. Yeah. Not, not you know, well, height and characteristics, yeah. hair length, stuff like that. Well, well, also like the species and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and also there's a sense why we're both from Earth. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is the power of assembly theory in that regard. That you, if, if you, so if everything, so the way to look at it, if you have a box of objects, if they're, all if they're all indistinguishable um then using your technique you then you what you then do is you then look at the assembly index now if the assembly index of them is really low right and they're all they're all indistinguishable then you've then it's telling you that you have to go to another resolution so that would be you know it's kind of a sliding scale it's kind Got of it. nice so you Got it. so those two kind of uh, are attention with each other yeah the, co the number of copies and the assembly index yeah that's really, really interesting. So, okay. So you show up to a new planet, you'll be doing what? <laughs> I would do mass spec. I would bring it. On a sample of what? Like, first of all, like how big of a scoop do you take? Did you just take a scoop? Like what? Like, uh, so we're looking for primitive life. I would, I would look, yeah. So if we're just going to Mars or Titan or Enceladus or somewhere, so a number of ways of doing it. So you could take a large scoop, or you go through the atmosphere and detect stuff. So and you could make a life um, a life meter, right? So um, one of uh, uh, Sarah's colleagues at ASU, Paul Davies, keeps calling it a life meter, mm -hmm. <laughs> a life meter, which is quite a nice idea because if you think about it. If you've got um, a living system that's producing these uh, highly complex molecules and they drift away, and they're in a highly um, kind of um, demanding environment they could be burnt right so they could just be falling apart so you want to sniff a little bit of complexity and say warmer 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 oh we found life we yeah. found the alien we found we found the alien elon musk smoking a joint in the bottom yeah. of the cave on mars or elon himself whatever yeah. right you say okay found it so what you can do is the mass spectrometer um you could just look for things in the gas phase or you go on the surface drill down because you want to find molecules that are you, well, you you've either got to find the source living system, because the problem with just looking for complexity is it gets burnt away. So in a harsh environment on, on, on say, on the Mar surface of Mars, there's a very low probability that you're going to find really complex molecules because of all the radiation and so on. Mm -hmm. If you drill down a little bit, you could drill down a bit into, into soil that's billions of years old. Then I would put in some solvent, water, alcohol or something, or take a, a scoop, Put it in, put it viol make it volatile. Put it into the mass spectrometer and just try and detect mm -hmm. high complexity, high abundant molecules. And if you get them, hey presto, you can have evidence of life. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that then be great if you could say, okay, we've found evidence of life. Now we want to keep keep the life meter, keep searching for more and more complexity until you actually find living cells. Mm -hmm. You can get those new living cells and then and then you could bring them back to Earth or you could try and sequence them. You could see that they have different so DNA and proteins. Go along the gradient of the life meter. Exactly. How would you build a life meter? Let's say we're together starting a, a new, new a company launching a life meter. Mass spectrometer would be the first way of doing it. Just no, 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 but that's, that's, uh, that's one of the major components of it. But I'm talking about like, I would, what, if it's a device, we got it, and, and branding logo, we got to talk about right. that. That's later. But what's the input? What's the like? How do you get to the um, I, a metered output? So I would I would take a life. So my my life meter, our life meter. There you go. Nice, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. um, uh, would have both infrared and mass spec. So it would have two ports, so it could shine a light. Um, and so what it would do is you would have a a vacuum chamber and you would have a, an electrostatic analyzer mm -hmm. and you'd have a monochromator to producing infrared um you'd add the sum so you'd take a scoop of the sample put it in the life meter it would then add a solvent or heat up the sample so some volatiles come off the volatiles would then be put into the 
into the mass spectrometer, into the electrostatic trap, and you'd weigh the molecules and fragment them. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you'd shine infrared light on them, and you'd count the number of bands. But you'd have to, in that case, do some separation because you want to separate. And so in mass spec, it's really nice and convenient because you can separate electrostatically, but um, you need to have that. Can you do it in real time? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So let's go all the way back. So this, okay, we're really going to get this. Yeah, the, let's go. The, Lex's life meet. Lex and Lee's no, life no, meet. Lex and Lee. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good, good, uh, good ring to it. All right. So um, you have a, you have a vacuum chamber. You have a little nose. The nose would have um, uh, some a, 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 a packing material. So you would take your your sample, add it onto the nose, add a solvent or a gas. It would then be sucked up the nose. And that would be separated using chrome, what we call chromatography. And then as each band comes off the nose, we would then do mass spec and infrared. And in the, account, in, the, in the case of the infrared, count the number of bands. In the case of the mass spec, count the number of fragments and weigh it. And then the further up in molecular weight range for the mass spec and the number of bands, you go up and up and up from the you know dead, interesting, interesting, over the threshold, oh my gosh, earth life. And then right up to the batshit crazy, this is definitely, um, you know, alien intelligence that's made this life, right? You could almost go all the way there. Same in the infrared. And it's pretty simple. The thing that is really problematical is that for many years, decades, what people have done, and I can't blame them, is they've rather they've been obsessing about small biomarkers on that we find on Earth, amino acids, like single amino acids or evidence of small molecules and these things, and looking for those rather than looking for complexity. The, well, the, be if the beautiful thing about this is you can look for um, complexity without Earth chemistry bias or Earth biology bias. So assembly theory is just a way of saying, hey, complexity and abundance is evidence of selection. That's how our universal life meter will work.